In the last lecture, we looked at the Islamic mathematicians. In this lecture, we're going to look at the Italian algebraists. So these are people who learned from what the Islamic mathematicians had done. One of the impo most important insights of the Islamic mathematicians was the significance of our Hindu Arabic decimal system in which you have 10 digits uh, that can represent the different powers of 10. And so the power of 10 is determined by the place value in which you put the digit. And this Hindu Arabic system of denoting numbers would be used throughout the Islamic world. And by the 12th century, Italian merchants who were working in North Africa would begin to pick this up. They would also begin to learn about the Islamic methods of doing algebra, doing geometry, and doing other mathematics. One of the most important Italian mathematicians of this time was Leonardo of Pisa. Uh, he sometimes wrote his name as Leonardo Pisano, and he also sometimes wrote his name referring to the family that he was from, the Bonacci family. Uh, he referred to himself as a son of Bonacci or Fibonacci in Italian. And today he is best known by this particular name, simply Fibonacci. He spent much of his early life in Algeria. His father was actually an Italian diplomat in North Africa. And we know that Fibonacci spent a lot of time learning mathematics, not just common arithmetic, but also more advanced mathematics, algebra and geometry. And around the year 1200, he returned to Italy, to Pisa. He would live the rest of his life there, and he would work on mathematics, and he published some of the most important early works in mathematics that would appear in Western Europe. And so we find one of the first books, the Liber Abaci, literally the book of calculations, in which he explains for the Italian audience this strange method of representing numbers using the base 10 system, using the, the Hindu Arabic numeral system. This is also the book where we find what is known as the Fibonacci sequence, the, the very famous sequence of integers that begins 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And each of the numbers that we get in this sequence is the sum of the two previous numbers. So 5 and 8 is 13, 8 and 13 is 21, 13 and 21 is 34. So we get this sequence. Uh, Fibonacci was actually looking at this sequence in order to count the number of rabbits you would have after a certain number of, of generations. Although we call it the Fibonacci sequence, it actually is much older. It's a sequence that was known to Islamic mathematicians, to Indian mathematicians. You can even trace it back to, uh, to the Greek mathematicians of the, the classical age. They certainly were aware of, of this particular sequence. And it's a fascinating sequence. There are all kinds of things you can do with it. One of the classic examples is looking at, at the seeds in a sunflower head. And uh, if you follow one of the, the spirals, the, the number of seeds in a given spiral is always going to be a Fibonacci number. And you can actually follow the spirals around in two different directions, and the two numbers are going to be consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Now, in addition to writing his book on calculations, uh, Fibonacci also wrote on geometry. He wrote on algebra. And he wrote on Diophantine equations, so these are equations from number theory in which you're only looking for integer solutions, things like the Pythagorean triples, where the square of one number, square of an integer, plus the square of another integer is equal to the square of, of an integer. And Italy, especially northern Italy, would begin to become an important center for the study of algebra. And most of the study of algebra actually was centered on the city of Bologna. Bologna was the site of the first of the great Western European universities. It was founded before the University of Paris, before Oxford or Cambridge. It was around 1088 that the university was first founded in Bologna. 
And one of the mathematicians who taught there in the 15th and early 16th century was Scipione del Ferro. And del Ferro was interested in the problem of finding a root of a cubic polynomial. So this is a polynomial of degree 3. And I need to say a little bit about finding the roots of a polynomial. You've got a polynomial equation. You're trying to find out where that's equal to 0. And in the last lecture, I talked about some of the Islamic methods and before that, Chinese and even Indian methods for finding roots of polynomials. One approach is to try to find an approximation to the value that, sets, that, that satisfies a given polynomial equation. In other words, trying to find an approximation to the root. Ideally, what we'd like to do is to find an exact value for that root, the exact number that satisfies it. And if we're working with a quadratic polynomial, a polynomial of degree 2, then it is possible to find the exact value using square roots and what's commonly referred to as the quadratic formula that gives you an exact value for the root. And this is the question that Del Ferro was pursuing. Is there a way of finding an exact value for a root of a cubic polynomial? Now, today when we think of cubic polynomials, it's degree 3, and usually we want to write down all three roots. But in fact, you only really need to be able to find one of those roots. Because if you can find one root of a given polynomial, then you can divide that polynomial by the linear factor, by the factor of degree 1, x minus that root, and you're going to get a polynomial of one lower degree. So if I've got a polynomial of degree 3 and I can find one root for that polynomial, I can then translate that polynomial into a polynomial of one lower degree, a quadratic polynomial, and now there are standard methods for finding the roots of the quadratic. So the real problem is just to find one root of the cubic polynomial. Once you do that, you've simplified the problem down to finding the root of a quadratic polynomial or a polynomial of degree 2. Del Ferro succeeded in doing this. And he shared his discovery with two other people. One was a colleague by the name of Anibale de la Nave. And de la Nave is going to appear again later in this story. And another person that he shared the secret of how to find a root of a cubic equation with was Antonio Fiore. Now, finding this root of the cubic polynomial, of an arbitrary cubic polynomial, would turn out to be extremely important because this is really the first time in the modern Western European tradition that mathematicians actually were able to go beyond what the ancient Greeks had accomplished. And so this was really showing, this now happening in the early 1500s, that European mathematicians of this time were actually able to go beyond what the ancients had managed to accomplish. Finding the root of a cubic polynomial was a very important watershed. It also was important for the individuals who were able to do that, because at this time, if you wanted to be a scientist or a mathematician, you needed to have a patron. You needed to have a sponsor. You really couldn't survive on your own. You could teach some math classes, but that didn't bring in very much money. And one of the ways to get a sponsor was to engage in competitions. And so one patron would take his mathematician and another patron would take his mathematician. And the two mathematicians would have a competition and whichever patron had a mathematician that was able to win, well, certainly that brought great glory to the, to the given patron. And so mathematicians who knew how to find the roots of a cubic polynomial now suddenly had a great advantage in these competitions. And one of the important early competitions took place between Fiore and another mathematician by the name of Niccolo Fontana. Fontana is better known as Tartaglia the Stammerer. And he got his name because as a young man in Brescia, where he grew up, uh, one, of, one day while he was quite young, uh, the French corsairs came through the city. Uh, they were raiding the city. 
and Fontana was slashed with a saber, uh, and he suffered quite a deep gash across his face. Apparently, it, it never healed properly, and so he had a speech impediment for the rest of his life. And from that, he developed the nickname the Stammerer, or Tartaglia. And Fontana, or Tartaglia, would turn out to be quite unfortunate throughout his, his entire lifetime. But he was a brilliant mathematician. And when he heard that Del Ferro had discovered how to find the roots of a cubic polynomial, or to find one root of a cubic polynomial, he began to explore this question for himself, and he discovered how to do it. And he then challenged Fiore to a competition. Now, Fiore had learned how to find the roots of a cubic polynomial, but Fiore was not a great mathematician. This was basically his entire bag of tricks. On the other hand, Tartaglia was quite accomplished. He had figured out how to find the roots of a cubic polynomial, but he also knew how to solve many other mathematical problems. And so when they held this competition, Tartaglia posed many different problems, not just finding roots of cubic polynomials, while Fiore only posed the question of finding roots of cubic polynomials. And Tartaglia went away from the competition with Fiore with a great deal of glory because he was able to answer all of Fiore's questions, and Fiore was able to answer none of Tartaglia's. Another mathematician who then became interested in this question of the roots of a cubic polynomial was Herolamo Cardano. Born in 1501, would die in 1576, certainly one of the greatest of the Italian algebraists of the 16th century. He was from Milan. He was the son of a very prominent uh, law professor, scholar of, of law in Milan. Uh, somewhat spoiled, he had quite a reputation as a gambler, and that tied into his mathematics. He actually did a lot of early work on probability. He also became known as a quite accomplished mathematician, but the one thing he was not able to do was to figure out how to find a root of an arbitrary cubic polynomial. And so he wrote to Tartaglia and asked Tartaglia to share the secret of how to find the root of a cubic polynomial. He invited Tartaglia to come to Milan. Tartaglia did so, thinking that Cardano might be able to find a patron for him. Despite his success in this competition against Fiore, Tartaglia had not been able to find himself a patron. And so he went to Milan hoping that Cardano could help him with this. Well, he went there, and he shared the secret of how to find the root of a cubic polynomial with Cardano. Uh, Cardano, however, did not find a patron for him at the time. Tartaglia asked Cardano to keep this a secret, because Tartaglia wanted to use this in order to arrange for patronage for himself. Cardano said, okay, but please publish it, I would like to be able to talk about this method for finding the root of a cubic polynomial. Tartaglia went home hoping to get this patronage which never came. Cardano was waiting in Milan for Tartaglia to actually publish the result so that Cardano could then publish more about it himself. And so both were waiting for the other. Eventually Cardano went to Bologna, and there he met Della Nave. Della Nave was that, that colleague of Del Ferro that I talked about earlier in this lecture. And Cardano learned from Della Nave that, in fact, this secret of how to find the root of a cubic polynomial was already known, had been known long before Tartaglia. Cardano, up to that point, had only known about Tartaglia's discovery of how to find the root of a cubic polynomial. And once Cardano realized that there were others who knew about this, he feel, felt that he had been released from his promise. And so he went home, and he now published his great work in algebra, the Ars Magna, literally the great art, in 1545. 
And in that book, despite his promise to Tartaglia, he explained the method for finding the root of a cubic polynomial, which won him the eternal enmity of Tartaglia. At the same time, there was another young potential mathematician growing up in Bologna, Lodovico Ferrari. Ferrari was born in 1522 and would die in 1565. Ferrari's father died when he was quite young, and he went to live with his uncle. And one of his uncle's sons, Ferrari's nephew, had traveled to Milan and gotten a job as a servant to Cardano. And apparently Ferrari's nephew didn't like being a servant for very long, and after a few months he simply left without giving Cardano any warning. Cardano was quite upset, and so he wrote to the young man's father and said, you must send him back. I need him as a servant. Uh, The father, Ferrari's uncle, was reluctant to force his son to go back, so he took his nephew, uh, the young Lodovico Ferrari, and said that he had to go back and serve as a servant to Cardano in his place. This actually turned out to be a great stroke of luck for Lodovico Ferrari, because he went to Cardano, and Cardano immediately recognized that this man had a great deal of mathematical talent. And so rather than being simply a servant to Cardano, Ferrari quickly became a secretary, and Cardano undertook to teach him the mathematics that he knew. And Ferrari was very accomplished in this, and very quickly went beyond what even uh, had been done by Cardano, He was able to take a look at the way of finding the root of a cubic polynomial, an exact formula for the root of a cubic polynomial, and expand this idea so that he was able to find the exact value of the root of an arbitrary polynomial of degree 4. So he went from polynomials of degree 3 to degree 4. Shortly after that, an academic position with a patronage opened up in Brescia, and Ferrari decided to apply for this position. Tartaglia was still stewing. He was in Venice at this time, and he decided also to apply for this position in Brescia. And in order to decide who would get the position, a competition was arranged between Ferrari and Tartaglia. And Ferrari was such an accomplished mathematician that in the first day of this, and and one can imagine what it must have been like, there would have been a stage set up in the plaza with the two mathematicians facing each other and one would propose a problem and the other had to work it out in front of the crowd. And then if he did it successfully, he would then propose a problem to the other one who then had to work it out in front of the crowd. And it must have been a great scene But at the end of the first day, it was quite clear that Tartaglia was falling behind. There were a lot of Ferrari's posed problems that Tartaglia was unable to solve, but Ferrari was able to solve all of the problems that Tartaglia posed. And so Tartaglia left before the competition was over. At the end of the first day, he fled in disgrace. He had clearly lost the competition. Ferrari was exultant that that he had succeeded, He was entitled to this position with patronage in Brescia, but his fame was such, he had bested Tartaglia. His fame was such that he was able to take any job, essentially, that he wanted in North Italy. And so he went back to Milan and got a job as the tax assessor for the city of Milan, a position that I'm sure was extremely lucrative. He would continue to to do mathematics, uh, but he quickly became a very wealthy man. Now, before I go on to the next mathematician I want to talk about, who is Bombelli, it's important to say a little bit about the method for finding the root of an arbitrary cubic polynomial. So I've got a polynomial equation of degree 3, so I've got some polynomial that involves x cubed, and I want to find an exact value for one of the roots. Now, it's always possible to translate the variable, to to move the variable, so that you can write this cubic equation in the form x cubed plus 
some number times x is equal to a constant number. As an example, we might take the cubic polynomial x cubed plus 6x is equal to 4. And we now take two numbers. We take that constant number 4, and we take the coefficient of the x. I had x cubed plus 6x equals 4. I take that 6. I divide it by 3. That gives me 2. And then I cube that number. I multiply three copies of that number together. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So my two key numbers for this particular cubic equation are 4 and 8. And the key to finding a root of this cubic equation is to find two numbers whose difference is the 4 and whose product is the 8. Now this is an old, old problem. It goes right back to the Babylonians. You know the difference between two numbers. You know the product of two numbers. You want to find out what those two numbers are. And that's a problem that can be restated in terms of solving a quadratic polynomial. And we know how to find the exact value of the solution of a quadratic polynomial. In this particular case, the two numbers whose difference is 4 and whose product is 8 are 2 plus twice the square root of 3 and minus 2 plus twice the square root of 3. So if I take the difference of those, I get 4. If I take the product of those, I get 8. I take those two numbers that I have found, 2 plus twice the square root of 3 and minus 2 plus twice the square root of 3, and I take the difference of their cube roots, and that will give me a root of the original equation. Now the next mathematician I want to look at is Raphael Bombelli. Bombelli was born in 1526 in Bologna. He actually worked as an engineer. He was not trained as a mathematician. He did not intend to be a mathematician. But early on in his career, he was commissioned to go up to the Val di Chiani. So this is a high mountain valley that's north of Rome. And to drain the marshes there. Today, the Val di Chiani is a very fertile land, a very important agricultural area. But at the time that Bombelli went up there, it was all marshland. So he was sent as an engineer to drain those marshes. And he succeeded in doing it, but it wound up taking him nine years to get these marshes drained. And the reason for it is in the middle of that nine-year period, there was a five-year hiatus in which there was a dispute over who actually owned the land that was in that particular valley. So Bombelli was up there in the Val di Chiani, cooling his heels, waiting for word to come through to, to begin to proceed with the work once the dispute over who owned the land was over. And during that five-year period, he was reading algebra. Uh, he was reading the work of Cardano, and he was very impressed with what Cardano had done, but he decided that he could do an even better job. And so he began to write his own book on algebra. Well, once the marshes at the Val di Chiani were drained, Bombelli had made his reputation as an engineer, and he was brought to Rome by the Pope for a couple of engineering projects that the Pope had in mind. The first of these was to restore the Santa Maria Bridge. This is one of the ancient bridges of Rome, uh, spans the Tiber at a very important crossing point. And periodically, it had been destroyed over the years by various floods. And after one of these floods, uh, the Pope brought Bombelli in to try to restore the bridge. Uh, ultimately, Bombelli was not successful. And I do have a, a picture of what the Santa Maria Bridge looks like today. As you can see, it's, it's not very appropriate for trying to get across the, uh, the Tiber. Uh, people finally abandoned any attempt to restore the Santa Maria Bridge in, in 1598. And today it's simply known as the Ponto Rotto, the, the broken bridge. Another one of the jobs that the Pope had for Bombelli 
was to try to drain the Pontine marshes. Uh, this also Bombelli was not successful in, and actually the Pontine marshes, which are a great coastal marshland south of Rome, uh, they would not be drained until the 1920s. It would be under Mussolini that eventually these marshes would be drained. But while he was in Rome, Bombelli discovered Diophantus' Arithmetica. So this is the great work on number theory and Diophantine equations that Diophantus had written in the early centuries AD. And he began to translate this work and to see how to incorporate it into his own book on algebra. And so eventually Bombelli would produce a very, very important work in algebra that would go on to influence not just the Italian algebraists of the succeeding years, but also algebraists throughout all of, of Western Europe. But one of the most important insights that Bombelli had was the importance of being able to work with the square root of negative numbers. So let me take another cubic equation that I want to find the root for. I'm going to take x cubed minus 15x equals 4. And the two numbers that we're working with in this case are 4 and minus 15 divided by 3 and then cubed. So I get, I want the difference between two numbers to be 4. And I want the product of two numbers to be minus 125. Now, that's a problem, because if I've got two numbers that are only four apart from each other, and the product of their magnitudes is 125, either these numbers both have to be positive or both have to be negative. I can't get a minus 125. So you can't find two real numbers whose difference is 4 and whose product is minus 125. But in fact, there is a root to this cubic polynomial. It's not too hard to see that 4 cubed minus 15 times 4 is 4. 4 is a solution. And so Bombelli wrestled with this question. The, the method of Cardano and Tartaglia and Del Ferro doesn't work in this case, but there is a solution. What's going on? It turns out that the key to this solution is to be able to work with the square roots of negative numbers. And Bombelli is the first person to start doing this. What he does is he shows that you get two solutions, one of which is two these two, the two numbers whose difference is 4 and whose product is minus 125. The numbers are 2 plus the square root of minus 121 and minus 2 plus the square root of minus 121. And if you take the cube roots of those numbers, you get 2 plus the square root of minus 1 and minus 2 plus the square root of minus 1. Well, 2 plus the square root of minus 1, minus 2 plus the square root of minus 1, take the difference, you get 4, you get the solution. So you get the solution, but on the way you need to work with these square roots of negative numbers. And so Bombelli is the first person to say, yes, we do need to work with the square roots of negative numbers, the square roots of negative numbers would later be called, by Descartes, imaginary numbers. That's a very unfortunate name. Uh, Descartes called them imaginary, and a lot of people seem to think that they don't exist because we call them imaginary. They are very important numbers. They're very real numbers in some sense, although we refer to the ordinary numbers as, as reals. Um, as we're going to see several lectures hence, in the 18th century, these imaginary numbers become absolutely critical to proceeding with mathematics, to making advances in mathematics. The numbers that can be built out of real and imaginary numbers, the complex numbers, are really two-dimensional numbers. And I'll talk about these much more later. We've reached the end of the 16th century. Algebra at this point is pretty well understood. 
In the next lecture, we're going to be moving into the 17th century, the century that I said is the pivot for this entire series of lectures. We're going to spend five lectures on the 17th century. This, these developments in algebra undertaken by the Italian algebraists would lay the foundation for this. In the next lecture, we're going to go back to questions in astronomy. Astronomy led us into trigonometry, and in the next lecture, we're going to see some of the important ways in which astronomy would provide the motivation for the mathematics that would be developed during the 17th century. And in particular, we're going to focus on John Napier, a Scotsman, and his invention of the logarithm.